Welcome to our August webinar, a collaborative presentation of the Federation for Children with Special Needs and the Recruitment, Training, and Support Center, RCFC. My name is Yvonne Rigo, Project Associate with RCFC. Today's webinar is Working for Healing with Expressive Arts Therapy, presented by presenter Cecile Red, founder of Art. For almost 20 years, she has serviced people with anxiety, mood disorders, sensory processing disorder, trauma, adoption, loss, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, developmental and cognitive disabilities, medical issues, Alzheimer's disease, addiction, LGBTQ and gender issues, pregnancy issues, caregiving issues, work-related stress, couples, families, and existential issues. Welcome. So um, for a very long time uh, in ancient history, we have used art um, in traditional practices um, to, uh, for, for many, many reasons, to mark significant package, passages in life, um, to celebrate festive occasions, to express feelings, to pray and to worship, and to heal the sick. And um, in, after the Second World War in the 40s, um, expressive arts therapy started to appear in hospitals um, a decade later um, in early education. And in the 70s, a formulation of expressive therapy as a profession started to um, appear. So expressive arts therapy is a multi-arts approach to counseling. Um, it's an integrative mental health profession and an established health service that's similar to CBT, play therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. The task of expressive therapy is not to eliminate suffering, but to give a voice to it and define a form in which it can be expressed. Expression is itself transformation. This is a message that art brings. The therapist then would be an artist of the soul working with sufferers to enable them to find the proper container for their pain, the form in which it would be embodied. An art artistic expression is defined as a creation which articulates the client's life experience and moves him or her, as well as the therapist, into a new dimension where he or she will have more perspective and insight on that particular matter. So you've probably all heard of Frida Kahlo, um, who had multiple me me medical challenges throughout her life, um, some that were really debilitating, and she was an artist. And she used her art to really express that experience of pain and suffering. This is another example of how um, art was used in a group. This group was for adults with epilepsy. And we started off with a guided relaxation, a tuning to the body, and then participants were invited to open up their awareness to the images that would come up during that relaxation, colors, sensations, um, any um, um, texturized way they could express their inner, internal state. Then we made art, and the artwork was used then to introduce one, one another um, and allow them to be visible. Uh, what I what I really like about this picture is um, if somebody comes to me and, and tells me I have epilepsy and this is my experience, I'm going to have information about that. But when I look at this image, um, I see water and I know what that water feels like in my body. Um, I, I can see the lightning and I know what that feels like um, experiencing lightning. So there's some sensory information that comes across through this um, image that gives a full experience um, of what this person might um, feel um, in relationship to their epilepsy. And then we use this image to dialogue um, with, with, um, uh, with, the, with, with the issue at, at hand um, and formulated intentions to go on in the group. So as I just kind of described, art making is inherently perceptual perceptually and sensory based and that's true for visual art, music, um, dance, um, 
sand tray, whatever art form a person might be using. And it involves the brain and the body in ways that verbal language does not. And it's true not only for the art making, uh, the art maker, but also the witness. The witness also gets this perception and sensory based information. Expressive therapy provides an alternative means of communication for those who cannot find words to express anxiety, pain, or emotions as a result of trauma, combat, physical abuse, loss of brain function, depression, and other debilitating health conditions. Expressive therapy is inclusive and it honors no neurodiversity. And I think this is probably one of my favorite um, aspects of expressive therapy. So one doesn't have to have um, verbal um, language, you can be nonverbal. Um, one can have a wide range of physical or cognitive abilities. You can be at any developmental stage, come from any ethnical or cultural background, speak any language or no language. Um, whoever you are, you can benefit for expressive, from expressive arts therapy. And this in inclusive quality um, is very special to me. Expressive arts therapy can be used in individual sessions with couples, families, and groups, and groups all sizes. It can be also in large, large community settings. Yes. So we received a question. Yes. And um, it is, um, does a client have to like drawing? Question. It's a very good question, and I'm actually going to talk about it in a minute, but I'll jump. Um, um, let's see. Oh, I guess I didn't put that in there. Ha! Huh. Actually, yes, you do not need to have any talent, and you do not need to have any skill, and you don't even need to have any interest in art. Um, that's basically the big difference between, oh, it's right here. It's a big difference between um, an art class and an expressive arts therapy session. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I work with individuals who come and have no particular interest in, in expressive arts therapy, but as we talk, I'm going to notice their body language and reflect back. And from that, I will ask questions specifically. I, I just saw you hold your hands very tightly. I wonder what that feels like, I wonder what that means. So those, those um, visual sensory experiences guide my questions. So even if they're not engaged in expressive arts therapy, I am creating a space where metaphors, images, sensory experience and movement are present and are brought to the attention of the client. So um, it says on this page, one does not need to have any experience with the arts or have any particular talent to be able to participate and benefit from expressive arts therapy. Um, art making is intr intr intrinsically therapeutic. So if you're making art, you will feel, ex you know, you will feel excited, you will feel relaxed. So making art is therapeutic. However, making art needs to be differ differentiated with expressive therapy um, because in, in expressive therapy, trained clinicians use art in therapy as a tool to reach specific therapeutic goals. So for example, in, if I am a um, two-year-old child struggling with speech development, I might use music to promote um, speech development. So that's a clinical way to use uh, music therapy. Um, if I have Alzheimer's and I don't speak anymore um, and I'm isolated, music therapy will stimulate the senses, activate the imagination and decrease the isolation of the elder. So then that, in that way, uh, music can be specifically used. Um, if I um, have trauma, um, expressive therapy can use in, in multiple ways to uh, create safety, to develop relationship, to attune, um, to develop coping skills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so during an expressive therapy session, the focus is not to accomplish a perfect picture, dance beautifully, or sing a perfect song. Beauty means something different. Beauty is defined by an internal sense of moving towards increased emotional freedom and connection with self and others. The creative process is skillfully used to stimulate the imagination, engage the senses, activate the breath, and get the body moving to improve psychological um, health, cognitive ability, and sensor motor functions. So here are some benefits of expressive arts therapy. 
um, self-discovery, we can gain a lot of insight. Um, there's a sense of accomplishment just by creating something. Um, it builds self-esteem and develops and helps people develop self-confidence. It's a healthy emotional release. So it's a place or a way um, people can practice self-regulation. Um, it helps with symptom management and coping skills for anxiety and depression. A good example I, I can name is um, I've been doing some groups in stabilization units with adults. And a lot of times these people are in crisis, so they're there to st stabilize. So a lot of times anxiety is very high. And I remember a particular instance where I brought clay and um, the client didn't want to sit down, was very stressed out saying, I want to go downstairs. I want to go to the emergency um, department. And I somehow invited that person to sit down and put a piece of clay. And the moment that client put their hands on the clay, the anxiety visibly decreased. So her, her face became less red, her, her body was less agitated, and within 10 minutes she no longer wanted to go to the emergency department. So it can be very effective. Um, it's a wonderful way to con uh, help connect the mind and the body um, and practice mindfulness. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's a way to build narrative in many, in many ways. So honoring multiple intelligences, you can create narrative with your movements, with your, with images, um, and not only with words. Um, it's client centered because it allows the client's body and mind to direct where, um, where communication and expression will be easier. So it's honoring neurodiversity. Um, it allows access to nonverbal and unconscious material, and um, it can give temporary relief in moments of high stress and extreme existential grief. Um, so an example that I, I just gave um, with this client in a stabilization unit, um, there was a lot of stress. People have done some really great work in prisons. People are doing some currently some um, work at the border of Mexico. People have done uh, places in refugee camps where ex expressive rights therapy can be really helpful in moments of um, high stress and extreme situations. This is one of my favorite images. I don't know if you have seen it uh, on the internet floating around, but I show it every time I can. So um, these are three images of um, the way we can think about inclusion, equality, and the right side is obviously the ideal. And I always think about expressive therapy being that right side. So if you put a piece of clay, um, it doesn't matter what size you are and, and, and what your capacity is, you will be able to do something with it. Um, and so it allows um, people to access care equally. So here, here are some few trauma facts, and I don't want to get into a big uh, trauma um, training, um, but I want to spend a little time on, on the sensory piece of trauma um, because I, I do feel like expressive therapy is, um, is very useful in that regards. So traumatic experiences you might know are primarily handled in the sensory processing network of the body and lower brain functions. Um, versus the narrative memory and the rational thought. Uh, trauma survivors respond instinctually to, to reminders of traumatic, traumatic events conveyed to them through sight, sound, smell, etc., with responses that are poorly or not all regulated by conscious awareness. So what this means is that if I'm a trauma survivor and I'm walking through the world, I am getting information through all my senses and um, I might get triggered and I'm not conscious of it because what's triggering me are something that has to do with a smell or a sound um, or something very subtle that I'm not necessarily connecting to that trauma. Once triggered, trauma survivors will have difficulty maintaining states relevant to the present context. So I could be in a classroom, you know, everybody's sitting down doing their work focusing and then suddenly um, a certain song goes on outside and that triggers me and so I'm going to be shifting in a state um, and I'm not necessarily conscious that that is doing that and then I might flip out and people are looking at me going why why am I flipping out 
Um, so this can be unconscious and also invisible to the outside eye, which make it really difficult to support. Increased anxiety and emotional arousal over an over responsiveness Oh, sorry, over responsive sensory states include symptoms such as sweating, pounding heart, nausea, trouble sleeping, irritability, or outburst of anger, difficulty concentrating, feeling jumpy, and easily started and hypervigilant. So, some of these are some of the physical aspects. And here's an image just to sort of um, illustrate that. And I, I, I like this image because it, it really shows how connected it is to our body. It can be really debil debilitating. Just a um, fun fact question, fun quote unquote, which one of these behavior may be an indication of underlying trauma in a child? So chronic absence or increased absence of school, poor or failing grades, behavior aches, aggression, all of the above, and probably you all know it's all of the above. So in the last, I don't know if it's decade or, or so, um, a big attention has been focused on uh, toxic stress. So it's a term that's um, used a lot when we're talking about complex trauma and specifically. Um, so children who have experienced uh, repeated trauma over several periods of, 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 of uh, so over several years. Um, so positive stress is just normal stress, like I'm experiencing right now. I'm stressed <laughs> out because I'm doing a webinar for the first time. And it's necessary, normal response to everyday life. And in fact, um, if you don't experience positive stress, that's unhealthy. So children are supposed to experience some positive stress. Tolerable stress um, is described by a traumatic event where adults can uh, come to the aid of a child to process and go back to baseline. So a car accident or a fire or a pet passing away or something like that that is traumatic. Um, however, because there's an adult present um, that can process it, the child can um, master those feelings and transform them so they can go back to a baseline of functioning. Prolonged exposure to stress, which is also called toxic stress in early childhood, lead to enduring alterations of patterns of the brain, um, which sets the stage for, for the emergence of psychiatric disorder. So what this means is that if we um, if we are making connections in our brain that are, are due to toxic stress over and over and over, it starts to alter the way we respond to stress. When the autonomic system is overactive, long lasting chemical and physical alterations in the body can change the stress response, which then activates more frequently or for longer periods than necessary compared to non-exposed children. Dysregulation and instability is typical as survivors cycle through shock, denial, fear, anger, shame, guilt, and moral injury. Um, so not only um, is the toxic stress affecting the individual as they're experiencing it, um, even when there's no specific tr stress, if there's a trigger, then the, the, um, the brain and the body are responding as if there was um, that toxic stress. So we can just imagine the long-standing effects of that. Sensory avoidance is a natural response to trauma until coping skills and new ways to relate can be made. This can, however, leave survivors feeling detached from others and emotionally numb. They might lose interest in activities and life in general. And then sensory craving may manifest as an attempt to self-soothe and gain mastery. So these are some um, of the things that adults um, who have experienced toxic stress um, repeatedly can struggle with. So here are some healing stages. I know there's a lot of um, theories out there and I just kind of went over my, my memory of the different stages that I have seen people go through. And, uh, Obviously, not everybody goes through these and they're not in a no particular order that, you know, people might do one, two, three, and then go back to one and then do three, four, and then go back to two. So there's no, it's a crooked line, um, but these are just some stages that um, 
we might have to focus on. So the first stage is always creating safety, building a relationship with a therapist, attuning. Um, an expressive therapy, art making, can be extremely valuable in this attunement phase, um, as well as the insight, um, gaining insight into the client's strengths, their patterns, their vulnerabilities, their triggers, what they like, what they don't like. Um, so it's a bonding moment and a time where uh, boundaries are are described and de determined and defined and um, it's almost like creating the cocoon or the or the um, the nest in which the work that you're going to be doing is is is, um, is the work that is going to be coming is going to happen um, and then there's a stage of stabilization I, I would say where clients will learn different responses to stimuli that cause neurolog neurological dysregulation so before we do any important narrative work or processing trauma, we want to make sure that clients are able to cope with some of these triggers and are able to do the work. They're strong enough to do that um, in the sense that they will feel confident about it because clients are extremely resilient, but we don't want them to have a negative experience with having to go into their trauma experience. Um, in this stabilization phase, caregivers, family, larger group um, uh, involvement uh, are very important because that's part of that stabilization and the support system of the client. So the involvement of who's around the client um, is very important. And then when all those things are worked on um, is when we wanna go into processing the trauma and reconstructing the story. Um, when that work has been delved into, clients can integrate um, a transformed sense of self and they do inventory of their belief systems and they look at, you know, if their beliefs are rational or if their beliefs are adequate for what they want to be or who they want to be. Um, and that work is, is a lot more, I would say, cognitive. We use a lot of CBT in conjunction with expressive therapy because we're doing a lot of reframing and a lot of... Um, helping um, the client see themselves in this new light of empowerment. Um, and then I would say other phases that people might or might not go through um, is connection to the larger community and connection to the spiritual world, to a spiritual world. I have a question actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can you explain how expressive art therapy may look like if um, it is done privately yeah. uh, versus in a school setting yeah. and how potentially parents or advocates or SESPs can um, request that your services um, come in and either mm -hmm. observe the child or mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit how, how that gets started, how that yeah. process gets started? And, what types of kids may benefit from that in the school setting? Yeah, okay. so I'm going back to the slide of the healing stages. Um, so I would say that the, the, the phase four client processes trauma and reconstruction story can really only happen in a safe space of an individual session. Um, but all the part of the client learns different stimuli response and so two and three, um, those are very valuable in school settings. So on, uh, helping teachers, helping um, after school providers, um, helping babysitters understand these shifting states or the behavior or why does a child doesn't, why, why is a child not responding to this limit setting? Um, you know, what understanding the behaviors basically. And I think that those are our, our areas where the schools really need to be involved. You know, creating um, trauma sensitive schools are important and the lens of expressive therapy specifically would be um, the understanding that the, the client is a, a sensory body, there's a mind body connection. And if a client is traveling through the hallway and has trauma, then that, that can mean a whole series of things. If you're, if you're traveling through the hallway and a teacher interrupts that student in the, in the hallway and asks a question and then gets a abrupt response, well, maybe that's because going through the hallway is not the best time to ask that student. You know? So there's a lot of, um, you know, in that aspect, understanding the sensory experience of the child's world. And, and I would say that 
we have to spend a little time with the child understanding and attuning and and get, you know getting insight into their strengths and then i think there's something that we can offer to to the school yeah but i i don't recommend doing client you know processing trauma in in, in school settings unless that's the only place it can be done which i have had unfortunately have to do but i would say that that's not that productive So healing trauma with expressive arts therapy. And so in the few slides ahead, I highlighted in red um, some of the qualities that um, expressive therapy has and that are specifically, I think, helpful. Um, so self-expression and so using the various arts to be able to express oneself um, is an action of exhibiting and practicing a novel and adaptive behavior. So self-expression is a behavior. So as a client is doing that, they are transforming already um, their experience. Expressive therapy interventions expand the individual's capacity for new behaviors and regulation in the face of life stressors and trauma triggers. Um, Communicate aspects of memories and stories that may not be readily available through conversation. So many times in, in sessions, I've had situations where a client might start drawing something or started moving. And then as the process would happen, things would come up that would have never come up if we had sat down and talked about it. Or it might have, but it take, would have taken a long time. But just the activation of the body, the joints, the nerves, and that connection to the body in that moment of insight um, makes that information really available. Um, safety containment. So um, making art is a structure in itself. So it creates some boundaries. If you're saying, let's make a box, that's a boundary. Let's play on the drum, that's a boundary. So there's a safety to that because you're focusing on a, a physical um, experience and there's a there's a um, containment that is intrinsic to to that process for some individual telling a story through one or more expressive modalities can be more easily tolerated and may be a corrective experience in itself this is a very sweet example of um, how expressive therapy can can be very helpful so this was a elementary school child who came into the session withdrawn and shut down and had just um, witnessed somebody get hurt and that was a trigger um, so the client uh, was able to express you know how they felt by creating a person and creating a, a space for that hurt person we got an actual band-aid and um, and in creating that art the client felt um, empowered they felt like they came up with a solution and were able they were able to move from being shut down disconnected withdrawn to empowered and ready to do some work and that was just a very easy simple way to to, to work with that I would say resistant but it's not really resistance it's um, a shifted state yeah. There are a couple of questions yeah. here. Um, so one question that um, just came through from Mary Beth was, um, how does the connection to a larger community happen? How does the connection? That's a big question. <laughs> can, she, can you get, be a little bit more specific with the question? Okay, um, so Mary Beth, uh, while she types that and becomes a bit more specific, I'm going to ask you another question yes. we just received, which is, um, do you teach individuals to be uh, able to do mindfulness and practice mindfulness on their own um, and to use anywhere? Yeah, absolutely. I give homework and I, you know, I, I, uh, we practice it in a session. Um, I model it with my questions and I model it where, where I create the structure where I'll say, you know, um, the example I gave earlier, somebody was holding their hands tight. I would say, you're holding your hands tight. How does that feel? 
the muscles, go into the muscles, you know, what, what information is there? So just bringing that awareness. And then sometimes I do give like, you know, guided med meditation exercises or um, specific homework to specific people um, according to their, you know, what they're working on and their growing edges. But yeah, that's definitely part of the process, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and Mary Beth um, mentioned, um, is it through groups or do individuals take the skills home to work on with, say, family? Okay, that's helpful. Um, so I think it's different for different people. So some people arrive and they have a support system. Their family is very supportive. Their community is very supported. They're part of a church. Um, they're very connected to their um, college buddies. You know, some people come with support systems. And so if we see them individually, they will naturally go outside and start, um, you know, sharing with their support systems um, the new changes in their lives. Some people don't come with those support systems. So in those cases, I would say groups are very effective. They act as a substitute as um, a family or um, a community group that might be supportive. I think it depends on how the client arrives, the level of trauma, the level of risk, the level of you know how long. And so it depends on a lot of factors. Um, but I do know that um, the expansion outside of the individual therapy to groups, to, to milieus, to, com to community are, are, are what need to happen for that full recovery to take place. Great. Yeah. I think that's it right now. So another quality of uh, expressive therapy is that we are put into action. So um, they're referred to action therapies. Um, participants engage in play and exploration. The experience of making and creating energizes, redirects attention and focus, and alleviates emotional stress, allowing clients to fully concentrate on issues, goals, and behaviors. Um, this is a quote from Kathy Mal Malchiotti, who's written a lot for expressive therapy, by the way. Look her up. Um, Improvisation and trauma recovery. So I have done a lot of improvisation in my life. I'm a big fan. Um, so I'll spend a little time on that. Trauma survivors need to relearn how to effectively integrate and experience, uh, integrate in experiences, sorry. Improvising with music, movement, or visual art, for example, can provide the opportunity to move through fight, flight, free states towards more embodied, integrated, empowered, fluid, and mindful states. In those states, we can master, masterfully respond to stress, challenge, and conflict rather than react by teaching us to stay present no matter what arises and giving us an experience we can trust. So in, in um, practices like EMDR, you know, they, what, what, what the client is experiencing is a, is a rewiring of how they're experiencing stimuli. So in, in theater improvisation, for example, which I've practiced a lot and used a lot with clients, um, it has a similar effect. So a trigger might come up through a movement or um, a story and um, through the improvisation, um, we're able to help the client shift their states um, to a more embodied place or have more perspective on that trigger and, um, and reframe the experience. Not to mention that it's very fun. This is a beautiful image you might, might have seen already. Um, we learn by doing. I love the hands and how it evokes the touch. Um, another area where expressive therapy is particular helpful is um, because it taps into the imagination. So this, this is from Carl Jung. The psyche consists of, essentially of images it is a series of images in the truest sense, not an accidental juxtaposition or sequence, but a structure that is throughout full of meaning and purpose. It is a picturing of vital activities. So expressive therapy may particularly be helpful to clients who are pre-verbal, non-verbal, or who feel emotionally restricted and helping them access the unconscious. 
Research indicates that unconscious systems of emotions can be at odds with the conscious intentions we have for our lives. By entering into relationship with these systems, we seek out some way to integrate them in our experiences, our life experience. Expressive arts therapy allows us to materialize and enter in dialogue with these images and symbols and invite transformation by offering us the possibility for trying out inventive solutions, which is true in the example of this um, young child who created a doll and um, invented a solution. This is a beautiful quote from Emil Zola. If you shut up truth and bury it under the ground, it will grow and gather to itself such explosive power that the day it bursts through it will blow up everything in its way. So the image is very powerful. Another aspect of expressive therapy, we've talked about this earlier, the mind-body connection. It capitalizes on the use of the senses to affect change. Memories in particular have been reported to emerge through touch, imagery, or carefully guided by body movement. They're not restricted, strictly limited to storage as verbal language in the brain. This is, I, I love this about expressive therapy because even as simple as choosing the material, arranging them, um, and this is something that I use when I've done expressive therapy with elders with Alzheimer's who can't speak. Um, some of them can barely use their hands, but just the fact that we are choosing material, choosing the color, moving them in a certain way, um, creates this um, empowered state of connection to the sensory um, world of the individual. And, and it doesn't replace language and it doesn't replace all the functions that this person once had. However, it does help um, decrease some of, the, some of the behaviors and the symptoms that they're experiencing because of their disease. And here's another wonderful quote. Body-centered psychotherapy is a kind of clinical work that puts the body into action as a means of accessing repressed and fragmented parts of the self. It operates on the premise that sensation, breath, and movement are the body's form of speech and that we listen to the speech, sorry, and that if we listen to this speech, we can complete and release stored trauma relearn how to feel excitement and pleasure, and engage in activities that nourish. This body speech often arises from the unconscious and from parts of ourself that have been, become fragmented and from which we have withdrawn. It can manifest as aches and pains, chronic health conditions, postural and gestural habits, and unusual sensations. I have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so the question is, which is better for children with trauma? Would you suggest group work or one-on-one -on -one work or a combination of both? And can you also explain a little bit more about the integration between um, unconscious and conscious of emotions? Yeah. Okay. So for, for group work and individual, I would say they're very different. Um, I think it's, it's, it's recommended to start with individual. Um, therapy again because the therapist can attune to the child and, and understand the child's world and then make recommendations if that's relevant. Um, so it's not either or, it's, it's um, both can be supportive and they have different functions in the, in the recovery process. Um, and then the connection to the conscious and the unconscious, very, a very good example would be um, um, uh, so if, if I'm uh, moving, for example, with, if a client is moving and I'm witnessing the client move and then suddenly, um, and the client is laying down for a good portion of the moving time, breathing, having a really hard time moving and then suddenly rises and that, that person might experience a feeling like, let's say shame. And then, so now we have information about how rising the body, def defying gravity or make taking space or uh, growing is, is associated in the brain as something 
to hide or something to be embarrassed about or so, so that's information that was unconscious and now because of this intervention the client has this information and that's empowering it doesn't fix everything right away but that's a very important empowering important information and then the client can absorb that and integrate that into their um, understanding and then transform the feelings so that's an example I think I was inspired by the image on the slide. With expressive therapy intervention, self-actualization does not depend on one's ability to verbalize or cognitively understand their own experiences. So this is really important because if I have, let's say, ADHD, um, recollection is very hard. And if I have ADHD and anxiety and trauma, so, I mean, recollection, it can be atrocious but movement can really help connect the dots, for example. So I put this YouTube on, on the slide because um, I came across it when I was doing some research uh, for a training. It's a beautiful story of um, trauma and how theater specifically um, helped a, a young girl um, recover or it was a wonderful container for her process. So I invite you to listen to that. Um, and then just to conclude about this, this uh, webinar, Expressive Arts Therapy aims to help trauma survivors learn how to find and maintain an optimal level of arousal, accept and love themselves how they are and provide them with skills in a language that is theirs to lead a life in which they can feel empowered and manifest the most authentic and healthiest version of themselves. And you know, what this means is that personally, I don't see myself as an expressive therapist, as somebody who will cure um, or who, who is the expert who has answers on how the recovery of a person will look, what it will look like, um, but a person who will create the space for um, the survivor to access their strengths and to develop skills and um, become the best version of themselves. I put on there our mission statement of, uh, this, of my center, Art Relief, and um, the services that we offer, individual, group, family, therapeutic mentoring, art lab, um, we do training, school consultations, and some home-based services. And uh, just to announce that we have every year a yard sale where we raise funds for our financial aid fund. It's on December 7th this year, 2019. And we have vendors who sell art and music and uh, performers and food, and it's a wonderful celebration and everybody's welcome. And some references if you wanna read a bit more on, on the topic. I have another question here yeah. from one of our attendees. Um, what is your favorite part or most in inspiring part about using expressive art therapy with trauma survivors? There's a lot of them. Um, and they probably, my answer would probably change every, every time you ask me. But I would say that one thing that I love is um, I think, first of all, as an expressive therapist, to be able to use all parts of myself when I work is a wonderful gift. So I, 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 I can think in images, I can experience my sensory um, uh, transference of a person, I can um, uh, have uh, movements that come up, words that come up, metaphors, and I can use all these aspects as tools to um, nurture the space that I'm creating with the client. So for me, it's very fulfilling because as a human, I'm, I'm alive. <laughs> um, and I think that to be in relationship with a client um, in those ways is very fulfilling. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's just very fulfilling to be able to develop that relationship with a child or um, an elder or a, a trauma survivor. It doesn't matter who, who I'm working with. It, it just makes a connection with a, another human much more meaningful. And it's extremely fulfilling because I can see how, how supportive and helpful it is. So that's also rewarding, I'd say. Excellent. 
And another question or a couple of questions that are coming through, keep them coming folks, um, is how do you work with someone who is uncomfortable with movement? Um, well, first of all, I would never force somebody to move. So if we never move, that's okay with me. <laughs> that's the first thing. So it does, it's, it, it's not going to be the end of their process if they don't move. It's fine. Um, but what I could do is uh, if somebody does want to move and is having difficulty getting there, um, I could create more um, structure. So instead of opening, going in a space and say move, I'll give a lot more, I'll, I'll structure the time or the space a lot more and, and then start um, decreasing the level of structure when the person feels safe. Um, to take on the ownership of that movement. Okay. And can you talk about the use of expressive art therapy as a way to deal with secondary trauma? Um, I think it's, it acts a very, in a very similar way. You know, I think that um, as expressive therapists, you know, we have to take care of ourselves or any therapist or any caregiver, any parent, we had to take care of ourselves and um, being able to do our art is, you know, it's, it's very important for us to be able to stay uh, connected to, you know, to and balanced and um, clear headed and grounded and centered and, and um, in perspective. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, we may have a few more questions here. Um, question, how many districts, school districts are using um, expressive art therapy as a way to work with their students? I would love to know that. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody out there has the census, I would like to know. But I do know that in, in several districts, I'm, um, it's not the public schools, but I'm in Dorchester and I'm in Cambridge. Um, I, I, I was in Arlington and um, Watertown. So I know that there are some expressive therapists in multiple towns um, and it's a growing phenomenon, thank goodness. Excellent. Um, another question just popped up. When working with children, how do you know what a picture means? That's a good question. Sure. So we, we don't interpret images and that's very important. We can have as a, as therapist, um, things can be, can evoke. So a movement or an image can, can be evoked as a result of something. Um, but we are, we're, we're supposed to know how to use that, um, information to guide our questions and to help the client, um, express what the meaning of that image is because it can mean it can really mean anything my association to a straight line is not someone else's association my association to the color green or blue or purple or black or white is different than another person so it's very important not to interpret because we can be completely wrong that must be very difficult not to interpret no. No. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have that responsibility. <laughs> Very happy not to have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. And um, another question is what current programs are running and who are they for? Do you have any kind of programs out in the community, like groups where folks can join if necessary, or within private schools or, or mm -hmm. you know, um, working with organizations, mm -hmm. definitely things like that. No, we, we generally get contracted to do a specific group in a specific setting, so it's a closed group. Um, and then at our center, we have um, um, Art Lab is a, a drop-in expressive arts therapy studio. Anybody can attend. We have some closed groups. We have a teen group that's been going on for several years. Um, we have some adult groups um, that happen during the fall and this in the winter. Um, so, but we are open to going wherever is needed, if okay. groups are needed. 
updated. Do you, um, I know that specifically you work with, um, you know, just a whole array of needs and issues. Do, I, and then saw that you work with children on the spectrum mm -hmm. um, who have ADHD, who have different learning differences, cognitive and intellectual. Um, does the issue of social cues and making friendships mm -hmm. and, you know, having meaningful friendships, does that ever come about um, in, in expressive art therapies? And then if so, how can that conversation lead to what skills they would learn to then mm -hmm. apply mm -hmm. in, in yeah. transfer? A good example is uh, in our teen group, um, we do a portion that is uh, movement based and sometimes we do some improv and then a portion that's art therapy. And um, in, in the movement break, sometimes we'll do um, improv games. And a lot of times the kids will say, why are we doing this? This is meaningless. So then we would say, why are we doing this? And then those in those games, we are able to talk about, well, it's very helpful to know what the body language is of this person. It's very helpful to understand um, how do you enter into the play of somebody else? So those skills are worked through play, through, through games. Um, or sometimes we'll go on walks and, um, and, and have like, you know, social skills cues uh, with us and we'll, we'll talk about them. So there are many ways we can do that. And through an art project, we can do that. Um, the point is that it, it's, it's driven by their interest and their, um, it has to be relevant and meaningful to their worldview. Because if I want them to learn a skill, but it doesn't mean anything to them, it's going to be my waste of time and their waste of time too, and frustration. So we try to come from the place of what's, first of all, playful and also um, relevant to their worlds and useful. So is play therapy a part of expressive art therapy, or is it something completely different? There are two different... Um, you know, two different uh, tools. However, a lot of therapeutic tools have similar foundations. Playfulness is um, a way to, to, to help learn. It's a way to, um, there's floor time that uses play. There's play therapy, expressive arts therapy. There are many ways that play is used. Um, and there's some overlap in many, many professions. Great. Um, also, um, does art uh, relief except mass health? And you did mention a little bit about the current programs that are running there. So that was a question and who they were for. Um, but do, does art relief except mass health? Yes, we do. And um, most plans of mass health, we do. It's very important for us. It's part of our mission statement. You can read it to include people. Very good. So wonderful. Well, yeah. I just wanted to thank you so much for, for taking the time and coming out. Thank you, Cecile. This was extremely informative. And I'd like to remind everyone that you will receive a follow-up survey. We'll be also sending out the handouts for today. Um, please uh, take a minute and complete the survey when you have a chance. And we value this information so that we can provide everyone with the most effective information to support the wonderful work that you do in supporting children. Um, we'd also like to mention and save the date, the RTSC's eighth annual Making a Difference Conference is on November 19th this year. It's a Tuesday. Um, so please RSVP, uh, put a save the date uh, on your calendar. And again, thank you again. Thank, thank you, you for having me. For Allowing me to speak of what I'm passionate about. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you for joining us today. Thank and you. we hope to see you again next time. Mm -hmm. This is ITSC.